Hello, this is Greg Gauss with Galactic Greg. It's coming to you on the 19th of July, 21. I am on deck 23, 50, 100 hours Central Daylight Time. 10 minutes till, 10 minutes till the anniversary of the moon landing, the 55th, the 52nd anniversary of the moon landing, and until Jeff Bezos hopefully has a successful suborbital hop mission into space above the Von Karnow. <laughs> A lot of argument between Bezos and uh, Branson about who makes space and who don't. I'll save that to the last. We got another issue to talk about here, which I don't think should be an issue. But a lot of people out there in media land seem to be taking issue with this whole idea of billionaires having joy rides in the space while people suffer on Earth. Well, let's shoot some holes in that. <laughs> because yeah, I think it's there's some very strong intrinsic value in what Branson and Bezos are doing to open the space age. So we're going to get all into that. We're going to talk about that. And Elon Musk and others, many, many others who have worked hard tirelessly for years to make space more accessible, to make it to the point that we may actually one day live and work in space. And what's the value of that? We're going to go all into that. You know, let's start with the question. A couple of perspectives here. Go outside and look in the night sky. Look up at all those stars. You see the pure, raw power of the stars, unadulterated, as far as we can tell, all natural. Astronomers with all their telescopes that have been peering in space for all these years have found no concrete evidence of anything that's not natural. We find planets and planets and planets and planets and planets on planets and planets and planets. The universe is full of planets. The universe is full of habitability zones with many planets in them. Some are out there. One would think that some of these planets that should be much older than ours, many, 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 many of them, much older than ours, some of them should have been suitable enough somewhere in the vast universe for a civilization to have risen some time back. It wasn't taking that long, cosmically speaking for that civilization to have spread through an entire galaxy. Fermi figured this out many years ago. And he would just, you know, just basically had an aha moment. He says, well, where are they? They ought to be here already. He just kind of mentally went through the numbers. And if you put them on a slow boat, you know, not going light speed, warp speed, but just, you know, a very small fraction thereof uh, with speeds that, you know, could be attainable by any, you know, reasonable spacefaring civilization without grandiose Star Trek technology, the entire galaxy should be colonized. It should be obvious that they're here, been here. Now, some people think they are here, but the, uh, the, it's not that obvious. See, the problem I got with that is this. Now, I'm going to have another view because now since I've broached this topic, I'll have to talk about that in the future, right? <laughs> okay, but here's the thing. Even if the UAPs and all that stuff were from somewhere else, and I said even, and the evidence of that is somewhat lacking this, as of this point. I mean, the evidence based on the videos alone. Or maybe you got something else, you go, oh, Greg, blah, blah, blah. But let's just focus on the evidence they presented us in the videos. But that's not the top of this thing. But I'm just to say right now, that's somewhat lacking. We'll talk about it in the future. All right. But what I'm saying is this. You should be able to look up in the night sky and see evidence of Kardashev two silver, top two civilizations. Kardashev top one civilization, which we're not quite there yet, is a civilization capable of harvesting or harnessing all the energies of the planet. It's thought that a civilization at our level should be there maybe within a hundred years, if you, maybe possibly. And once you start working space, you should be able to quickly, within a very few generations, sleep to be in a Kardashev top two civilization, which can harness all the energy of your star. That means your star should essentially wink out. And what all you should see from that star would be waste heat, just kind of a redness. We should be able to look in space. A top three civilization would be able to harness this galaxy. Our galaxy has been around long enough. We should have. And so the many other galaxies out there that are close enough that, that, that you're not going too far back in time, but you see them. We should be seeing evidence looking out in space of top two and top three civilizations. Can't see nothing. Is it that civilizations 
just don't survive long enough to get out in space. Look at ourselves. Are we on the verge of our own demise? Could we possibly get out into space and ensure the survivability of our civilization so we'll have all of our eggs on basket earth? Maybe we can put some of our eggs on some other baskets, such as the moon. Okay, that's a, <laughs> I got that one as a kid, that when we were going to the moon. Okay, a little rough, but anyway. Is there some possibility? Mars? How about oh no cylinders? I'm quite fond of that concept of oh no cylinders. And as you may have noticed, I've done videos where I've come up with concepts, detailed out my own concepts for uh, how to live in the skies on Venus. Quite comfortable, I might add. Much more comfortable than you'd probably live on Mars. <laughs> and I'll be doing more on that in the future too. About how you, I'll talk about how you can actually mine Venus. So I'm oh, great, it can't be done. Oh, yes, it can. <laughs> we'll cover that. But, you know, here's the thing. We're not seeing diddle. Nothing. So what are prospects for getting out there? Well, look, you know, we've had government space programs since before I was born. You know, going back to 57, I was born in 60. So, you know, there have been government space programs now for 60 four years and they just uh, the most they've been able to manage is some flags and footprints and now we're struggling to get back to doing flags and footprints again are we ever going to settle space in that notion i mean the governments have done all this you know they with a whole lot of effort and expenditures we managed to put a few guys living in antarctica or a few guys living in low earth orbit around space that's not space so that's not space development that is Flags of footprints <laughs> or you know, traces in the sky. It's not settlement, it's not development, it's a step. It's a step. A lot has been learned. But it's going to take the powers of private enterprise. There's got to be some initiative, there's got to be some economy out there, there's got to be some way to develop it and have it pay for itself. There's got to be some way to have space earn its own way. And that's one of the things that private enterprise, yeah, capitalism can bring to you. Demand economies aren't going to get us there. There's got to be some return that keeps it going, like a chain reaction. It grows based on the resources you get to. It's going to take private companies to do the kind of investment, carry the water. There's just not enough money in the government coffers. And it may seem, you know, it may seem to some to be a waste and a social injustice to be spending money up there when we got problems here. But then ultimately, spending money there is going to help alleviate our problems here because there's vast amounts of energy and resources in space. Jeff Bezos has this great dream, for example, of taking industry off the surface of the earth and have a lot of industry operating in space so we're not putting the environmental burden on our planet here. That thing may seem like a giant leap. But eventually we could get there by using the resources of space, in space, and then bringing them here. If you got to launch everything from Earth, it's going to be prohibited. But if you can use resources there, but you got to start somewhere. You got to eventually have some process facilities in space, some mining facilities. Well, you got to first be able to have private companies that can actually make a little money in space so they can get the initiative and grow in these directions. Uh, Jeff, uh, Elon Musk seems to have a big leap start on that, but he shouldn't be the only player in the game. There needs to be competition. Now, I'm a fan of what Musk is doing. And Elon Musk has said basically with a Starship, with this, this is the 3D rendered print of the Starship with a super heavy on it, which is another visual. I don't have that. But we've got this guy, which kind of resembles it. <laughs> yeah, super heavy Starship. <laughs> Watch. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, I'm having a little fun, but nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with Bezos having a little fun. Nothing wrong with uh, Branson having a little fun. If they want to go into space, uh, that's been their lifelong dream. But in so doing and so promoting that, they have started the development of the industry that can take us there. They can take more things there, more people, make it cheaper. Elon Musk says that he can get it down the cost of fuel. 
in the cost of fuel, if he's reusing all this stuff, he claims it's about $9 a pound. Now, I'm sure he's going to have to amortize his development costs over that. He's going to have to uh, what find the number of vehicles he's talking about flying. That's going to be small, too. He's got to have some profit margin. Hey, an industry profit margin is about 8% typically. You know, it's about, it gets 10 or 15%. For $9 a pound on top of that, that's nothing. Wow, if it could get space on $12 a pound, holy guac and smoke markets. People aren't going to believe that. By the way. Ah, there's no way. That's what we got in our heads, the way costs start today. But it's possible. And the uh, actually, China has leapfrogged us in hypersonic plane research. They've got an aerospace plane concept, hypersonic. It can fly to orbit. Therefore, instead of burning, carrying all the oxygen, with, which is the heavy part of the fuel, it's using the air for a whole lot farther piece of that axle. Flies up like a plane, comes down like a plane. And it flies part of the flight then it's rocketry. But if they can get the, uh, uh, the air part over Mach 6, then they've got some real advantages, some real potential. Scram jets, hypersonic jet engines may be the key to making it happen. We're working on that kind of technology too, but the, they have leaked progress in that. That can make this whole thing here obsolete. It can make the space even more accessible and cheaper. But they don't have, they're not, unless they employ private enterprise in it, they're going to have to have something to make all that work out there. You have it paid back to you. That's the beauty of, of private enterprise. So, and I would submit, you know, China's been really good at still in technology. It seems like maybe for a change, they might be innovating something there. <laughs> but a lot, most of their technologies have been things they've taken from other countries. So, so we got to take a hard look at this. And maybe, and maybe that what they're showing is just a bunch of cartoons. They may not be there. They have done a suborbital flight of some kind of space plane. But then, hey, I've done that myself. I did the balloon launch return vehicle <laughs> back in. Hey, 1998. <laughs> it was a rocket plane. That's a balloon. All right, guys. So the bottom line is this. There is real value to what Bezos and Musk and uh, Branson are doing. Real value because they're developing systems. And uh, look, there's also a virgin orbital. It's not just Virgin Galactic for tourism. There's Virgin Orbital, which is launching satellites. Already launched satellites to space. So Virgin is already going to space, orbital space. And so the suborbital hops. Now Bezos has been a little slow at it. Maybe he'll pick up since he's uh, given up his CEO ship of, uh, of uh, Amazon. Maybe he'll pick it up. Maybe he'll go faster. But there, the real value is this. Today, we got all our eggs in one basket. We're living here on this earth. Earth is a finite resource. Even though it's 8,000 miles in Amber and 25,000 miles around the equator, seems really large to us, with a rapid growing civilization, it is a finite thing. Space is infinite. Greg, we shouldn't go out in space and include everything and mess everything up. Well, we're talking about things like mining asteroids. What are asteroids? They're just rocks. These are rocks that are all going to pump into each other, eventually smash each other up anyway, or smash into one of the other planets and make a really big mess. Instead of letting them wipe us out, why not, why not use them to spread light? Build O'Neill cylinders, fill them full of light, green in the cosmos. What a beautiful dream to take something inanimate and give it the ability to, to be alive, to transform that material into living creatures. They can look back at the universe and see the universe and appreciate the universe. We give the universe eyes and ears to appreciate and adore itself. The artifacts of the great creator. <laughs> so, and we, maybe we honor the great creator in that manner. So we don't believe in the creator. If we're not, at least we can give eyes and ears to the universe. Now, all that said, these are things that can extend the survivability of our species. They can give those young people today who are worried, can, we, can they survive through this era we're in? I got a chat session on my Green Grace channel last night who was really, really concerned about a war with China. That he was scared. He was absolutely right. He didn't think he could survive, would survive. Now we do have challenges from that, challenges to our grid. But one of the big things we can do is get our eggs out of one basket. That's Elon Musk's reason for wanting to go to Mars. So 
know, there's elements of that that, that has its value. You know, I see going to Venus. <laughs> uh, Musk is ahead right now. <laughs> I'll start promoting this vision. Maybe somebody will pick it up and run with it down the road. Using maybe nothing less than these little vehicles will be perfect for, for selling Venus. <laughs> perfect. I'll go into that in the future. So that this is my Venus ship. <laughs> it's must. It's must Mars ship, but hey, uh, you do some amazing things with Venus with these things. Believe it or not, yes, you can land in the atmosphere <laughs> and take off from the atmosphere. Now, remember, rockets, but uh, you don't have to have a rocket to land in the atmosphere. In fact, they're medically sealed due to the specific density of the Venetian atmosphere. If these things were humidity sealed and had basically Earth layered inside, they would float at about the 50 kilometer level. Or the atmospheric pressure is earth normal, the temperature is earth normal. Got a lot of acid on the outside, but that's all. Gravity is 90% of our gravity. See, temperature is the same. <laughs> pressure is the same. Hmm. Hard to beat that. <laughs> and just float naturally. Yeah, because the Venetian atmosphere is the carbon that has such a higher molecular density. So, isn't that interesting? <laughs> if you put Oh yeah, and then you've been a mix of these things can refuel back to back. Oh, if you put them in this configuration of the ancient atmosphere, you have a strong back 300 foot long to build maybe your first sky station. That's going to be in a future video. Okay, all that said, that's why I got two of these. <laughs> yeah, finally this idea. So, as long as you don't lose your rudder flaps, man, you'll be in serious trouble. <laughs> I missed the pen here. Don't lose your pen. Elon, don't lose the pens. All right. Seriously, though. Here's where the billionaires can bring us something new. And the good thing is they have competition. They have different. Each one has come to us with a different design, different systems, different ideas. A government comes up with one system. It's always a system of political compromise, like the space shuttle, like the space launch system. It was meant to achieve political objectives. Uh, an entrepreneur isn't trying to meet political objectives. He's trying to meet his dream or some business objective. Ideally, a business objective. But the business has got to be able to make business. It's got to be able to make money, to grow, to develop. And it's got to be able to tap into things out there that you can grow from. Once you tap the resources of space in space, you can grow exponentially without it being limited to the cost to get from here to there. That's a game changer. That is a huge game changer. Space is full of energy. Solar energy in space is very intense. It gets attenuated from the upper air atmosphere. You can get it 24 7 if you're you know, further out in space, you know, away from Earth, you know, further and further away from Earth's shadow, the more and more you get. So, in geosynchronous orbit, you're in the sun over 99% of the time. Some people propose satellites in geosynchronous to bring energy back to Earth. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of that. But you could use that energy in space to process things in space and bring them back to like platinum grid floors found from the moon, which you can bring back to Earth through using fuel cells for a hydrogen economy to make our energy system much more efficient without tearing up the platinum grid metal sources on Earth, which will be limited for those kind of applications and bare Earth metals. Probably just the asteroids are probably full of that stuff in the moon. So, and helium 3 from the moon may be used for fusion power to make a clean reactor that will not produce more nuclear fuel. So, you can give the reactors to Iran or anybody you want to, and you, and you just sleep all night without any worry that they're going to make something shoot back at you. And then have a nice thing energy. <laughs> so, hmm, isn't that interesting? So there, there, there are many things we could do down the road in space. Space is full of energy. Space is full of materials. Space is full of room. Space. Space to build. Space to grow. Room to grow. But to get there, we need the small private companies. We need the entrepreneurs. We need the people with the dreams. It might be a boyhood dream they're chasing. That's okay. You know, if we can't dream, then who are we? That's the essence of being human. It's to build a dream, have a goal. There's nothing better, better than that. 
that's a good thing. As long as it's a worthy goal, a good goal. I mean, you know, you're not trying to take advantage of somebody else and walk on, their, walk on them to get there. So maybe these guys, some of these billionaires might have done that to get their money. Here's maybe their chance to earn it back for society to give us all a future that we can survive and thrive in. A prosperous future. We don't have all of our eggs in basket earth. So what do you get out of it? <clears throat> the ability to continue to grow our civilization infinitely without destroying our world. That's all we know. The ability to build new worlds, clean worlds, beautiful worlds, habitats in space. There would have to be an ecological harmony to survive. Do you have closed loop ecological life support systems? We'll learn so much from space. How to be better stewards of our planet here and take a lot of the load off this planet. Now, uh, the thing is, though, process people don't reproduce as fast. So we may have issues with having great hordes of people that settle all this stuff. But still, that might be taking more pressure off the earth. So we could have a beautiful future. Thanks to space. Other thing that space does is this: if we, we get to orbital tourism, we get to orbit. Higher above Earth you get, people get to look down. And what do they see? When they fly around the Earth, they see no borders. They see a beautiful planet. By the way, they get, and they see this planet against the darkness of space. They realize just how precious our beautiful blue jewel is. It's called the overview effect. Frank White, a, a buddy of mine, wrote a book about it called it the overview effect. And that effect these astronauts have is go, oh my gosh, we're one, we're one family, we're one people. We all share this planet and the atmosphere. So thin compared, so after, you know, 99% of the atmosphere is only 20 miles up. Just 20 miles, 99% of the atmosphere. It looks thin when you're looking at it from space compared to a world that's 8,000 miles in diameter. Huge difference. Very thin atmosphere. Very, and, and oceans only a couple of miles deep. You realize this biosphere that we live on is a very thin, very thin sphere on top of the big earth. And you realize just how fragile we are. How fragile we are. How small we are. How precious we are. What a jewel this planet is and that we shouldn't be divided because there's no borders you can't see borders why are we so divided a lot of this division goes to political aspirations of the leaders of the world we'll find a way to take the wind out of their cells so that they're not so adventurous militaristically oh yeah green leaves just did a video talking about that <laughs> that's my alternate person on my other channel so there's a lot we can do in time. And my friends, I say, let the billionaires have their fun. Because in the end, they're going to help everyone, you and I. Because through their initial steps, we'll all be able to reach from the stars. And we should be able to get there, actually. Right now, it may be just the rich. But eventually, as these systems develop, Maybe we'll all be a good go. Right? Just be a choice. The you know, moon, Mars, asteroids, oh no cylinders, Venus, or beyond. It could happen. We want to take the load off this planet and keep it as a beautiful, pristine place. As long as the sun and potential asteroids or comets that we don't even pack it will allow. But with a space program, we could divert a lot of that stuff keep things nice here for a lot longer, you know? If the dinosaurs had had a space program, if the dinosaurs had had Jeff Bezos, <laughs> Elon Musk, Richard Branson, they might still be here. But I guess since they'd be munching on us, I'm, I'm kind of glad they're not. <laughs> but you know, here's our opportunity. This is our, and maybe we owe it to the universe to be that civilization. It can spread out a little bit and kick back and look at the universe and all and wonder. Now, see, one of the things that we fight over on Earth is limited resources. One of the big things of war is all this territory is so precious because that's all there is. So we got to fight over all this territory, this resource, or this trade route. 
once you get the whole universe at your disposal, why are you fighting over this stuff? And I got a home habitat concept too. That'll take a whole lot of the attention out of it. Because when you produce everything you need out of your own home almost, you know, what need to have you to fight? So that's what we need. We need to be able to have the resources available from space to be able to live within our, our own home. There's things that we could do to change this world and make it infinitely better and take down the tensions that drive us to warfare so that we can all look at each other and say, yes, we're one big happy family. Happy being the key. And a big part of this, a big part of this, a big part of getting there is getting the space. And the people leading the way right now are Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, and Elon Musk. I don't say one before or the other to give any preference to any of them. They're all doing amazing stuff there. <clears throat> now, they've all probably got a few checker marks on their way to getting there. We all do. We're all human beings. But that part of what they're doing needs to be held and embraced, not attacked by so many other people. I just want to show, share an article on here. Somebody having a little pity party attacking them. You know what? It ain't worth it. So just ignore those people. Because <laughs> that's pretty future. Future pity parties. Forget about that stuff, guys. We, we, we need to look up the stars and reach for them because we can, we can go there. These guys are helpless. I've done my own little shit. Oh, yeah. I've done my own share. For those that don't know, I think I'm showing a few videos. This is a rocket motor. This is a hybrid fuel grain. This is a solid of fuel grain of the Hart Cat's Prize rocket. This is the daddy of the spaceship one motor and the granddaddy of spaceship two motor. Air launch rocket, hybrid rocket motor, nitrous oxide, hybrid fuel. Uh, this has got uh, a drop sole terminated polybutadiene fuel grain, HTPB. I'm also falling asphalt. Actually, I like asphalt better. <laughs> it's better regression rates than this stuff, which is the military solid rocket fuel minus the oxidizer. So what did I do with this asphalt fuel grain? See this? Guys, 1997 Space Pioneer Award. The who? Gregory H. Allison. What? Entrepreneur. Why? Because I launched the Halo SL Space Launch 1 rocket that year. On 11 May 1997, hybrid air launched rocket. We started a company from that called the Hark. My original program was Halo, how to lift off. Halo, and get a rocket from a blue on it. Off we go. And I'm not a billionaire. But, you know, hey, I wasn't able to get on top of that rocket myself. But we started this, and the billionaires picked it up and did something bigger with it. I didn't have that kind of money to do it with, but we got it. We got some of this started, so we can all play a role in this. I've had a hand in it. Any of my friends, team members, I had a great team. People here. You know, you've seen some videos with Tim Pickens, Bill Brown. Oh, they're just the tip of the iceberg. A lot. We've had. You know, I, I was fortunate to leave one of the best teams of young. Bright minds, hardworking people that achieve these wonders. So <clears throat> it's doable, but sometimes it takes some money to really make it happen. To take it to the next level takes serious money. And that's why it's a good thing that some people can amass a few billion dollars because that's what it takes. So let's hope they figure out how to do something beyond making a small fortune in space. You know, the old adage, how do you make a small fortune in space? You start with a really big one. Hopefully, the only way space is going to work is that they actually turn it into a business proposition. It is self sustaining. It's got to be an economy. We have to develop economies in space that use space as ongoing development economy. And that's what we hope they can do. It may start with tourism. But once we develop the vehicles, the technologies, and get this going, then we've got the opportunity to build new worlds in space, changing everything you've ever known. So then we're no longer, economics is the management of scarcity, limited resources. It's over. It's the end of economics as we know it. <laughs> that is the beauty of it. That is the radical notion. That's where we could go. 
You may have a hard time accepting that. But just know this. These billionaires are doing, it's really awesome. It's really good. We should embrace it and celebrate it and cheer them on, not try to attack them and pull them down. So we get the little pity parties. Let's move on. Let's embrace them. Let's encourage them. And let's hope for the best. All right, my friends. With that, I'm going to say, oh, wow, look, it's already the anniversary of the moon landing. Hey, hey, I got the right hat on. See that? You'll probably see me again later today. Hopefully, hopefully, talking about a successful launch. Bezos, oh yeah, Bezos is carrying up a uh, lady, Wally Funk, who will be the oldest astronaut to ever fly in space. She was in a group known as the Mercury 13, 13 ladies who basically went through some level of astronaut training, although they, they were never part of the Mercury program or NASA, but uh, they, uh, she was a, uh, a uh, pilot trainer way back. So a very accomplished individual. So it's a good thing that she is going there, but I think she's probably going to fly also. At least she's got a ticket to on uh, Virgin Galactic. <laughs> so, hey, Galactic Gregs, Virgin Galactic, hey, I like those guys, but I like them all. I just wish Bezos would pick up and move faster. <laughs> so, let's see. All right, yeah, Virgin Galactic's already launched stuff to orbit. Bezos has. <laughs> Bezos started earlier. Okay, Bezos, you got a little catch up to do. Well, Virgin Galactic, sorry, Virgin Orbital, but it's, you know, it's part of the Virgin Group. Okay, but. Under brands. All right, guys, with all I'm going to say, let's hope the best for the future. Hang in there. This, this is going to be a very interesting decade for space. And thank you for watching.